So now on to the main event. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Jim Hannon is the president and CEO of Georgia Pacific. Uh, Georgia Pacific is a company that really needs no introduction in this city. Pulp, packaging, paper products, building materials, and other products closely associated with pulp and paper. Uh, Jim joined GP after it was acquired by Coke Industries in late 2005. He was promoted to president and chief operating officer in 2006 and was named CEO in 2007. He began his career with Coke Industries in 1998 when he joined Coke Mineral S Services as chief financial officer. He left Coke for two years to work as corporate controller at Homestake Mining Company, but came back to Coke Mineral Services as CFO in 2001. In 2004, he was named president of Invista Intermediates, another Coke company. Jim is a native of Connecticut and graduated from Cal, uh, Cal State University East Bay, and the earliest part of his career was spent in public accounting working for Coopers and Librans. Since moving to Atlanta, his community involvement has included serving on the boards of the Atlanta Com Committee for Progress, the Atlanta History Center, the Commerce Club, the Center for Human and Civil Rights, and as a trustee of the Woodward Woodruff Arts Center. Jim, thank you for taking the time to come here. Please join me in welcoming Jim Hannon. Good morning. Good morning. You know, every time I hear an introduction, it reminds me that I've had a hard time holding down a job. Uh, before I get started, I, I always like to get a feel for the room, so maybe I can get a little participation by a show of hands. Who watched the season premiere of American Idol last night? <laughs> wow, is that weak? I mean, a lot of people were afraid to raise their hands, I'm sure. I have three daughters. I can assure you it was on at our house. So, Rich, thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks to the Terry College for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. You know, when I look at the list of folks who have been at this podium, it is really a list of the movers and shakers in the state of Georgia and in our nation. And it, uh, as I said, is a great privilege for me. It's a personal and uh, professional privilege to speak with you here in the first month of the centennial year of the Terry College of Business. Clearly, you've come a long way since being founded as the University School of Commerce back in 1912. So happy birthday in your first center, century of education. I understand Terry College has watched 55,000 alumni go from homework to building homes, to building Atlanta, to building prosperity, to creating jobs in Georgia, in our nation, and around the world. I'd like to be the first then in this centennial year to lead a round of applause for the achievements of the Terry College. Well done. Here's to your first 100 years and to the future. Thank you. What is so 100 years as an institution, five generations stretching back to the time of our great-great-grandparents. You heard in my bio that I have been involved in the Atlanta History Center. In fact, I've been involved in the History Center since uh, just a couple of months after I arrived in Atlanta. I'm involved there because I find history fascinating for two reasons. One is we learn from it. Second is it often repeats itself. I think that's an interesting point. So let's consider for a moment what the world was like when the Terry College was founded. In 1912, a trip down Peachtree from Buckhead to downtown Atlanta and back was an all-day ride on a mule wagon. Cars were a little more scarce in those days. Today in 2012, there's still plenty of drivers that act like mules on that drive. <laughs> but it only seems to take the better part of the day. In 1912, Atlanta and Georgia were still coming into their own, recovering from the Civil War, coming to terms with a modern world, just 20 years earlier, Asa Candler had created the Coca-Cola Company to bottle and sell Dr. Pemberton's mixture. And our own company, Georgia Pacific, would be founded just 15 years later in a small Augusta lumberyard. See, all these folks are going, I thought we were going to get that economic update. Where's the dean? <laughs> in 1912, Great Britain dominated the world economy. When the Terry College was founded, the sun literally never set on the British Empire. British commercial might and force of arms, especially at sea power, made that island nation the richest and most influential in the history of the planet up to that time. 
so mighty that even the language of the British Isles became the language for merchants and markets all over the globe. From the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 and on through conquests, commercial and military, in Europe, North America, India, and China, the only setback for the British Empire came in the 1770s when Massachusetts farmers stood their ground and fired the shot heard around the world, the American Revolution. Things looked very rosy in 1912 for the British Empire. And I imagine many folks thought the sun would never set on the British Empire. But how soon change would come. The transforming event was, of course, World War I, a conflict that began in 1914 and that cost the British Empire an entire generation of its best and brightest talent. That war's human and economic cost, coupled with an even more destructive world war just a generation later, were fatal blows to the underpinning of the British Empire. The treasure and vitality, the creativity and innovation, and sheer manpower bled away in two colossal wars effectively ended British world domination. It happened in a twinkling, historically speaking. In a roughly 30-year span, Great Britain went from the greatest empire the world had ever seen to just another rebuilding nation. The United States, without a shot fired in the lower 48, stepped into that vacuum of power. And from 1945 on, the 20th century became known as the American century. Let's hope that the 21st century is remembered by that name as, as well. But I have to wonder if it will. It seems to me today the United States faces its own transforming moment. For all our past generations, America has now arrived at a time and place when our next decisions promise a dramatic, long-term impact on whether our nation can continue to prosper and lead. Unlike Britain, our decision won't be made on battlefields, and it likely won't be made by generals. Instead, it's far more likely that the folks in this room and the leaders we choose going forward are going to make the decisions of the future course of action for this nation. So what decisions do I talk about? <clears throat> decisions about our free market system. Decisions about whether free enterprise will guide our progress as it has for the past 236 years in this great nation. On whether we'll stand by or whether we'll stand by and let out of control spending, overregulation, political cronyism, and irresponsible politics jeopardize America's future too. There are three things I'd like to cover today as we talk. First, the challenges to our economic system. All of us here in this room as business folks face in this troubled political and financial environment. Second, what I believe is necessary for our economic future, including making the right choices, choosing the right leaders, and taking the right path toward more, not less, economic freedom. And then finally, I'd like to hear your questions and have a dialogue about your thoughts. Our voices and our choices matter right now. So to begin, let me start with a short commercial about Georgia Pacific. I know most of you are familiar with our company. We're a long-term corporate citizen of Atlanta. Uh, we operate in three primary businesses. You heard from Rich. Uh, we, we operate in the consumer products business, in packaging and building products. We employ about 40,000 people around the world. About 3,000 of those are here in the metro Atlanta area. Georgia is also our, uh, our largest present as a single state. We've got over 20 facilities and about 7,000 people. And we've been part of this community for many years. We continue to believe Georgia and Atlanta is an excellent place for our headquarters, thanks to a well-educated talent pool, evidenced in the room, a great international airport, and a city government that is committed to fiscal management. As you well know, the past several years have seen some pretty tough business conditions. In spite of this, Georgia Pacific employees have kept their focus on staying true to our principles, creating value by manufacturing excellent products that meet the needs of our consumers and our customers every single day. This focus has allowed Georgia Pacific, along with other Coke companies, to keep good, high-paying, good jobs for 50,000 Americans directly and another 200,000 indirectly all across this country. Financially, the last three years have been three of the best in Georgia Pacific's history. And I'm proud of that performance. In particular, I'm proud of our people for that performance. When you think about the building products business being a big part of our business, you think about the last three years, some of the toughest environment, in, really in, in our lifetimes, for the construction industry. But perhaps what I'm most proud of is not just the financial performance of the business. In the face of that tough economy, in the face of that tough building products environment, the last three years have also been the safest three years in the history of Georgia Pacific. 
each year a record in terms of every lagging and leading measure we track for our safety performance across the company. Coke companies typically reinvest 90% of their earnings back into the business, and Georgia Pacific's been no exception to that. Since the beginning of 2006, we've reinvested about $7 billion back into Georgia Pacific in the form of acquisitions, capital investments, innovation and investments in improved efficiency, improved compliance, safety and health across our organization. We've also at the same time paid down about $8 billion of, of debt. Now those, those uh, factors have allowed all of the major rating agencies to upgrade Georgia Pacific to investment grade and in some cases higher than that. All of that reflects that strong performance in a very difficult time across, uh, across our economy. Now, I make this point not, excuse me, not to brag about the performance of the company, <clears throat> but to tie it to something that we believe firmly. And that is the key to our success is tied to our management philosophy, a philosophy we call market-based management or MBM. And simply put, market-based management is our best attempt to take the principles that make the free, markets, free market societies the most prosperous and apply those inside our firm something we try to do every single day. A key to our MBM philosophy is creating a culture based on a set of 10 guiding principles, a culture that allows us to use MBM to have that success. A goal in this environment is to have every employee act as a principled entrepreneur. It's language we use all the time at the office. And when I say principled entrepreneur, what does it mean to us? For us, that means every employee optimizing, maximizing, long-term creation of real value while always acting lawfully and with integrity. That, that is what we think about every day in our organization. So the point here is we believe these free market principles work inside a company and we think our track record proves it. We also think these same principles work in a nation and that the track record of the U.S. proves it. You see, entrepreneurship's at the heart of our company, and we owe our existence to the vision of an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are constantly striving to meet the needs or wants of customers and consumers in new and different ways. In other words, they innovate. As I said, I'm proud of our recent accomplishments, and it's great to celebrate those successes. And we try to do that at every chance we get. But the reality is success is one of the most difficult things for us to overcome as well. What do I mean by this? <clears throat> a lot of you that, that know me have heard me say this before, and there are a few GP faces in the room. It's easy for us to forget what got us our lead, what differentiates us from our competitors, why people believe in us and have done what they've done. And it's easy to let the weight of that success make us complacent or make us stop doing what got us our lead and start trying to protect our lead. So what I mean is that we have to stay focused on continuing to improve faster than our competition. When a business improves faster than its competitors, it grows. When a business gets complacent and falls behind in innovation and continuous improvement, it lags behind and it risks being the victim of what we call creative destruction. Now, I, I like to say that internally a little more aggressively, like we'll be dragged down from behind, have our, our throats slit and be killed. Because that's, that's how business works, right? I mean, you all are familiar with it. That's what actually happens. Look at, look at people like, uh, like Borders. I mean, that was a great story 10 years ago, right? Look at Kodak. That's creative destruction at work, right? So a country can suffer similarly when it starts to get complacent or it stops doing what got it there and starts to try to protect its success. So improving and innovating the essential components of success depend on economic freedom. Economic freedom is a key point for the discussion today. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean by economic freedom. And I'm going to use a, a couple of tools here to do this. But the Economic Freedom of the World Index is an annual study that's compiled by a group called the Fraser Institute. It does that in partnership with SMU and Florida State University and a number of professors from those institutions. They do it with public information provided by the World Bank, the United Nations, and other sources, but pretty objective data, generally. The index measures economic freedom, and it does that by looking at some 40 factors, but roughly you can group them into five buckets. <coughs> First of those is, is really uh, the, role, or the role or size of government, and that gets measured in large part by, 
both spending and taxes. The second is, is uh, the regulation of credit, labor, and business. Third is access to sound money. The fourth is freedom to trade. And the fifth is the rule of law. So the protection of personal property rights, things like that. This study consistently shows that societies with greater economic freedom enjoy greater prosperity. So what I'd like to do is show you a very short video that's going to make this point with some data, show you the correlation, and help you understand it a little bit better than I could in the, in the time we have today. Imagine you had to live in a country from one of these two lists for the rest of your life. Which list would you choose? There he goes. If you're like most people, you would choose A. Let's take a look at why that is. Take Chile and Venezuela. Chile's poverty rate is half that of Venezuela's, and its inflation rate is a fraction of the size. Actually, all of list A appears to be better off than B. Look at income per person. It's 10 times higher on average in list A. But these lists aren't organized by income. They're organized by economic freedom. List A countries have the most free economies in the world. List B, the least free. Across the globe, we see a strong relationship between economic freedom and people's quality of life. For instance, people in the most free countries earn, on average, over eight times more than people in the least free. The poor earn 10 times more. People in the most free countries are happier. They have better protected civil rights, cleaner environments, and the average person lives 20 years longer. The freest countries also have less corruption, less infant mortality, less child labor, and less unemployment. So if you care about improving people's lives, then you really care about economic freedom. And having economic freedom means your property is protected under an impartial rule of law. You're free to trade with others for what you need and want. Your money keeps its value because your national <clears throat> currency is stable. And government stays small relative to the size of the economy. For years, the U.S. was among the world leaders in economic freedom. But over the last decade, the U.S.'s ranking fell and it's projected to keep falling. The question is, will our quality of life fall with it? If you like this video and want to join the discussion, visit facebook.com slash economic freedom. Okay, so, so when, when I say people enjoy a better standard of living, I don't mean they're just wealthier, right? What I mean is they've got access to better medical, better, better medical care, better food, they live longer, their air, water, and land are cleaner, and so on, and you heard all of that. Now, one, one important point I want to make, and it's, it's kind of key to what you see happening today, I think, in, in our country. You heard about protecting personal property rights, and you hear often people talk about equal treatment under the law. Important distinction, that doesn't mean equal result. And I'm not going to bring that up a lot today, but think about it something important. So we at Georgia Pacific and all co-companies believe that economic freedom leads to greater wealth creation, societal progress, and to prosperity, based largely on the measures you just heard. We also believe that our country's economic freedom faces a great test today. The competitiveness of U.S. businesses is under tremendous pressure, from increasing government spending, over-regulation, high corporate taxes, and in some cases from lower-cost competitors around the world, whether it's labor, capital, or otherwise. In the last few years, the U.S. has fallen, and, and you saw that list, actually, that's, that's last year's study. The U.S. had fallen from, in 2000, uh, third on that list to sixth. Actually, last year we dropped to tenth, and we're very, very close to dropping beyond that in all those measures. So it's important to understand it. And it's not just that our competitors are improving faster than we are, as I said earlier. We're actually moving backwards. We're actually moving backwards in those measures. The decline reflects in large part the increasing size and cost of government and increased regulation that's occurred over the last, uh, last several decades. And I say that to make sure that you don't think this is a partisan set of comments. That is true under both political parties over that last 20-year period, as an example. During the Bush years, government overspending led to a doubling of our debt. Under the current president, we're on, we're on pace to do that again. 
and these are not small numbers, I know you all are aware of this, but if you add up current government spending, the cost of regulatory compliance, the U.S. debt, which by the way now is bigger than our economy, right, our, our economy is roughly 15 trillion, 14 to 15, the U.S. debt is now over 15 trillion dollars, trillion, I mean, can you believe those numbers? It is hard to believe. And then you add, you add the, uh, the promises of future outlays, the entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. This doesn't really account for all the state, state issues we have, right? You're talking about 10 times the size of the private economy. It's pretty scary. And it isn't getting better. We're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend. A lot of folks in this room run a business. Everybody in this room has their own, I'm sure, their own checkbook or their own balance sheet. How long can you run your business or your personal balance sheet under a circumstance where you're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar. Not very long. We'll be out of business, all of us, right? So let me make another point. I'm not saying all regulations are bad. There is a legitimate and productive role for government society, and that means there's a legitimate role for taxes. It's not the point I'm trying to make. Governments can and should establish the rule of law, protect private property rights, and provide for public goods like roads, dams, ports, national defense, etc. But our government's reach now extends way beyond the vision of our founders and our Constitution. For example, today regulatory compliance alone costs businesses about $1.75 trillion a year. It's about 12% of GDP, and that number over the last decade is up 70%. Staggering. We could employ 43 million workers for $1.75 trillion a year. It's about a quarter of our employment in this country. The, the, uh, the Directive of Federal Regulations is now 81,000 pages. It's like the 10 million commandments. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I saw an anecdote um, a couple of weeks ago from somebody. If you, if you look at the Constitution and the amendments, it's, it's something under 10,000 words. I think 8,700 words is the number I recall. Words, not pages, right? If you look at the regulation of the sale of cabbage in this country, I, I understand that's 29,000 words now. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, to be honest, but that is something that, that uh, sort of makes a point. And the reality is, for everybody who's in business in this room today, I didn't have to tell you anything about that. You all know from what you deal with in your business every day, the cost of dealing with regulation. All of this growth in spending and regulation crowds out business, right? And it continues to add to the uncertainty that every one of us in business faces every day about where and how to invest and whether to hire and add resources because you don't know what the rules are going to be. Now I'm going to try and lighten it up and show you another video. This one might be a little funnier than the last one. So if you could roll the video. <clears throat> What's this? We did it. We did it! <clears throat> Karen, we made a profit this quarter for the first time in two years. We won't get moved up. Get raises. Get that house I promised you. I already bought the payments. Ah. <sighs> Rafi, sales are back. Marching right down to the boss's office to share the news. Frank, your numbers never lie. We got plenty of dough. Let's do it to it. Ah. No, no, Grandma, <coughs> not Julio. Frank. Hey, gang, just put the pep in your step. Business is back, and Karen and I are buying a home. It's a real American dream. <laughs> Boss, profits are back, cash flow is good, Steve's dance moves are better than ever. It's time to expand, grow, to create jobs. I taught Buffett and Gates everything they know. I always win, I look younger than I am, and I open beer bottles with my teeth. <coughs> but I always look before I leave. So Ralph, how are taxes? No clue. We may or may not have to pay higher taxes really soon. Hmm. <laughs> Care and HR costs? Totally unclear. New health care law could mean a number of things. Steve, government affairs? What they said. Plus financial reform, more government spending. <sighs> Who knows? Sorry, gang. Confidence is low, uncertainty's high, and Washington is kicking us around. And I don't like being kicked around. <laughs> you mean no expansion? No American dream? No dollar, dollar, dollar bills? No can do. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Who's 
Julio. <laughs> I wondered if that last part would get a laugh. So a little humor embedded in that, but the underlying message, unfortunately, reflects reality. So if this isn't troubling enough, let me share another statistic about how we've allowed ourselves to move away from the founding principles on which this country was developed. A decade ago, and th there's an annual survey that gets done by, I, I believe it's the Wall Street Journal that does a survey uh, about the best systems for an economy. And in 2002, 80% of US citizens believe the free market system was the best system. In 2010, that percentage dropped to 59%. It's hard to understand that, right? What's, what's maybe more difficult to understand is in communist China, 68% of those polled believe the free market system was the best approach. So in communist China, there's now a stronger belief in free markets than there is in, in the US, at least as a percentage of the folks polled. Another poll in 2009, Rasmussen uh, polled Americans under 30 and found them to be roughly evenly divided on whether they thought that uh, they preferred capitalism or socialism. Everybody hear that? I'm surprised I didn't hear any size or anything. So here's the challenge we face as business people. People are losing faith in the free marketplace, and it's especially true with our up-and-coming generations. The challenge, then, is different than it has been in history, though, because it's not caused by world wars or natural disasters. It's not other external factors, right? It's structural. We have structural problems, and they're of our own making. So for example, if you think about that level of debt to our GDP, that is not the highest it's ever been. It was higher than that after World War II. But we had a massive amount of defense spending that we could cut as a result of that, which was discretionary once we weren't in a world war. So it was very easy to fix that, and the economy grew, and things resolved that. Today, the non-discretionary portions of our budget are, are close to 90%. I think the number is 87. And I think it depends how you count defense in that number, by the way. But in the past 20 years, this crisis has been institutionalized, out of control spending, political cronyism, Rampant government over-involvement in business and economic matters, it's totally embedded now in our system. Totally embedded. It means the next gener generation of business leaders is going to inherit a crisis that's not short-term. By the way, it means our kids are too, right? But actually built into the system. So that's the challenge. And it's a challenge big enough, as I said, in my opinion, to put us on the wrong path. If you look at that economic freedom index, by, just here's another example of it. If you look at that index and you look back to the early 1900s, Argentina had a very free economy, was ranked about seventh on that index by those same sets of measures to the extent they, of course, available. Today, in fact, the most recent, they're 119th. And if you look at what they've done, nationalization of assets, growth in government spending, increasing tax, rate, tax rates, the kinds of things that we're talking about every day in this country to solve our problems, to provide, right? Those are the issues. So how do we right the ship? We've got to fix the faith of Americans on a North Star based on economic freedom, on an economic system that made us prosperous, that made us happy, and that made us the envy of countries around the world. We've got to make the right choices, choose the right leaders, and take that path toward more, not less, economic freedom. Our government's making it harder for entrepreneurs and companies alike to make decisions about investing in growth, adding employees, and innovating. Now, you, you saw that video. Again, it's a spoof. It's a, it's a bit of a joke, but the reality is that underlying message is true. How many articles have you read in the last year about the balance sheets of corporate America and how much cash is piled on those balance sheets? It's not because people don't want to invest and generate a greater return for their shareholders and the folks who have an interest in that performance. It's because of the things we're talking about. They don't see the opportunity based on these factors. Too many businesses, government intervention, often in the form of subsidies and mandates, picks winners and losers. And it causes greater uncertainty about what the rules are going to be in the future. And I could spend hours telling you about how this affects our business directly. Too many businesses have successfully lobbied for special favors and treatment, seeking mandates for their products, subsidies in the form of cash payments from the government, and regulations or tariffs that keep major competitors, more efficient competitors at bay. Cronyism is much easier than competing in the open market. That's just the reality, right? If you can get somebody to do it for you, you don't, have to, you don't have to win. But it erodes our overall standard of living. It stifles entrepreneurs by rewarding the politically favored rather than those who meet the needs of our consumers. Unfortunately, when government subsidies exist as a company, and I'm sure everyone in business knows this as well, once they exist, you have to take advantage of them 
or find yourself competitively disadvantaged with those who you compete with. So businesses have to stand up to other businesses on the front end at every turn to lobby and fight against these kind of special political favors. The purpose of business is to efficiently convert resources into products and services that society values or makes people's lives better. Businesses that fail should be allowed to go bankrupt rather than being bailed out. People always say then, though, what about the jobs that are lost as a result of that? And I would tell you that not all jobs are created equal. A real job profitably produces goods and services that people value more highly than their alternatives. Subsidized jobs, inefficient jobs, waste resources and lower our standard of living. They weaken our economy. We in this room, others in boardrooms, others in business, mom and pop dream factories, everybody around this country, all of us in business now face tough, tough decisions about our leadership and our political system going forward. Our task today is to move our business environment more toward what it was at the origins of our country. Less government, less regulation, uh, regulation that creates value, politicians who serve our interests and not their own. Our elected officials would do well to remember that the most prosperous countries are those that allow consumers, not governments, to direct the use of their resources. We need to make sure that this is heard loud and clear. It's up to us to choose and demand accountability from our leaders and get the U.S. back on track. If our elect elected leaders stop hindering business, American businesses and entrepreneurs will pull the economy ahead, like they always have. When business is free to compete, to reinvent, to adapt, to imagine what might be, instead of what has to be, based on regulations and guidelines, innovation happens. Innovation has been important in the past, and it's going to be important to what we have to do going forward. Just as, as business has led in the past, it has to lead in the future. From Edison to the Wright brothers, Graham Bell to Gates and Allen, we've led in the U.S. in innovation in the past century. With his death, death, all the stories of Steve Jobs and how he changed the world through the power of innovation have helped us understand that. How many of you remember when CDs were new? How about eight tracks? Oh, okay, good, me too. <laughs> how many people still buy CDs for their favorite music? How many iPhones are on silent in the room right now? How many aren't on silent? <laughs> Who checks their email only on their desktop PC when they get home at night? All of these things are changes that have occurred because of things that, out, that outdated old technology. And I say old technology. All of us can remember when the things I just described didn't exist. A lot of that is already outdated old technology. We didn't even know we needed those new ways, but they've made our lives better. As we think about innovation's role in preserving the next American century, let me share another statistic with you. In the US, there are about 4.8 million patents on file with the Patent Service. 2.7 million of those are held by U.S. companies or, or persons, about 2.1 of those by foreign held, foreign held. In 2008, for the first time, foreign awarded patents exceeded U.S. awarded patents, and it's continued since. Another trend that, that should concern us. Rather than stifling innovation, we've got to urge our government to encourage it by letting market forces, not subsidies and mandates, drive. Now more than ever, we need an increase in innovation to remain globally into competitive. As the recent economy presented many challenges, the efforts and focus on innovation and value creation by Georgia Pacific employees has generated good results and positioned us to be successful in the future. So I want to leave you with a thought that I express just about every chance I get when I talk to the GP employees. We know that our competitors and our potential competitors, whether they are local, regional, national, or global, are working hard every day to, to improve and to better meet the needs of our customers, to make our products and services obsolete. So we have to improve faster than the competition. We have to make our products and services obsolete. We have to practice that creative destruction on ourselves before they do it to us. The U.S. is in the same place. We're on the hinge of history here for the country. We've got to choose and demand accountability from our leaders now. The way has got to be cleared of stumbling blocks for innovation to occur. We have to force that change to happen so that businesses aren't in a position of checking more boxes on a form than they are shipping to their customers. We've got to throw the, our voices and our votes behind economic freedom and get the U.S. back on track. It was said 100 years ago that the sun never set on the British Empire. 
Ronald Reagan said back in the 80s that it was morning in America again. If that's true, it's time for business leaders to wake up. It's time for business leaders to lead and that our government be put on the side of progress, fiscal responsibility, and accountability. It's time we rise to the challenge that endangers our economic freedom and revive our economy. Let me close with one last video. Ying 现在他们都得给我们干活。You <laughs> can change the future. You have to. Join Citizens Against Government Waste to stop the spending that is bankrupting America. Okay, so with that, I'll open it up for questions. If you have a question, uh, if you would uh, signal for a microphone, uh, we are taping this. For our, our webcast. Hey, uh, you talked about uh, regulations and, uh, and uh, government regulations, uh, and maybe you agree that uh, current recession or lack of expansion is driven by the uh, housing bust. So, what do you think? What are your comments or thoughts on what drove the housing bust? Was it uh, a lack of regulations? Uh, or the poor decisions by banks by lending the money or poor decisions by consumers for borrowing the money? Well, it's a, I mean, you sort of answered the question to some degree, I think, but it's, it's a little bit of all of the above without question. But, you know, in this, in this country, we, um, we've had a view that the American dream is to own a house. And I, I think that's a fine dream. But for, for the longest time, that meant you saved, you positioned yourself to take on the responsibility and accountability of home ownership, and you made your own bed, right? So if you borrowed money to buy a house, you live with the consequences. We, we started kind of about 95, you can look at the data, but mid 90s, we started putting in place policies to try and make it affordable for everyone to own a home. We put some government sponsored entities in business to support that activity. And we, we presented then a structure where anybody could buy a home, right? So. 5% down kind of things, right, for people who couldn't necessarily afford a house otherwise. Lots of policies that supported that. And then in addition, like, like any market would, it started to take advantage of those things, right? So banks and, and lenders and other institutions created tools to create a capital pool for those opportunities because they were supported by a lot of these agencies and entities and structures, right? And then people made lots of bad decisions, and I'm sure there was fraud and other pieces to that, but all those things came together, and you can look at Lots of kinds of data to show you this, but if you look at home ownership rates in the U.S., for example, for 40 years they would hover between, say, 64 and 66 percent of the population. From 95 through about 2007, you'd see they went from about 64 and a half or 65 to almost 69 percent. At the same time, we had some stimulative uh, interest rate policies in the country for a various number of reasons, right? But as a result of that, money became less and less cost. The time of money became less and less costly in the form of interest rates over that time, so people borrowed more. <clears throat> and the asset value values appreciated as a result of that. So all of those are factors, but underlying is a set of policies that, that was intended to stimulate home ownership, and it, in fact, did that. And you can see, again, if you look at real valuations of homes over very long time series, you can see that they hover in a very narrow band until you get to about that time frame and then they double. And it's the same set of factors driving. The underlying policies created an incentive for things to happen that were, were different than what historically had happened. And, and it drove uh, an excess, if you will, a bubble. Just like any kind of stimulative behavior does, right? You can look at cash for clunkers. You can look at the $8,000 first home mortgage uh, opportunity that was put out there. Each of those created a bubble. Those were short-lived because the policies were short-lived. But each of those created bubbles in industries 
based on that change in the capital structure and the resources available. Other questions? Thank you for a, a reasonably eloquent job of defining what I think is maybe the most critical problem in our society. But um, two questions. One is, what are y'all's thoughts about how you bring a near-term uh, increase in the political will and courage of our leadership in Washington to actually address these issues first? And secondly, if you had that cooperation, uh, do y'all have some ideas about how to reduce the government to the extent where we can begin rolling the ball again in the right direction? Well, I, I, obviously that's a, a huge set of questions, but I would say, um, you know, we have to find and elect people who believe these free market principles, right? And then we have to hold them accountable. And, and really, I mean, that, that is what I said, but what I mean by that is we have to find people who are, are committed to it in a way that they're going to go behave consistently with that, even if it means they're not going to get reelected. Now, there's lots of things that could be changed in terms of the way the, the process works, that you know, term limits and other kinds of discussions that come up, I'm, I'm not going to address those. It's certainly not my expertise. But ultimately, if we can't get folks in power that have the political will and the stomach and they have the support of enough of us, right, and of businesses, right? I mean, the reality is it, it wasn't meant to be subtle, but businesses are lining up at that trough, right, to take advantage of subsidies, mandates. I mean, we got folks from, from Georgia Power and Southern Company here they are fighting this at every single turn. I can promise you that. We are, we are competing with people who want to burn wood like we did at the turn of the century instead of making paper out of it at some fraction of the value because it's going to be subsidized or mandated, right? And then guess what? It's going to end up in our utility rates. Now, that's a simplified version of me telling you that. But if we can't find people who are going to commit to that and then support them, right, then I don't think we have a chance. And the, the staggering... The things you see on that list of economic freedom, the index, I mean, th that is staggering change in 10 years. Staggering. And it, it is a, if you watch what's happening in Europe, particularly in the South, we should learn a whole lot of lessons from what we see happen in those economies because many of the things we're driving toward are, are policies that have created the situation that exists there over a much longer period of time. And in the U.S., we do have some things that are different, right? We have demographic benefits. That, that some of those Southern European countries don't have. Our population is growing. In the Southern European countries, that's not the case. They're shrinking. And so that is a difficult place to be when you've created a lot of future bets and burdens. Having a smaller population to carry the water ultimately isn't sustainable and it has to change. We still have the issue, but not to the same degree because we have the benefit of a growing population. Immigration being a big part of that, by the way. And the reality is if, if that were to change, this would be a tougher discussion even still. So, I'm back. Jim, thank you for your thoughts this morning. This is kind of a tangential question, but I'm curious as a person that's done business and lived in a lot of places, how do you view Atlanta and the state of Georgia and kind of where we are and how we <laughs> compete with competing economies and regions around the, the southeast and around the country? Yeah, you might find it interesting that these, these organizations, Fraser Institute, I think Heritage may do this too. It's a different institute uh, that does some economic freedom work. But they actually do state rankings and things too. And I'm not as familiar with the state rankings. But uh, what I would tell you is my experience in Atlanta and in Georgia has been good. You know, generally speaking, I think when you look at what's going on, and I, I'm more familiar with, quite frankly, Atlanta than I am with Georgia and more involved. But I would tell you that what, what you see going on this, in the city of Atlanta to um, create more confidence in the fiscal leadership of, of the city and to make some changes to some of these structural issues that I described at the local level. I, I feel pretty good about those things, and I think for the long-term competitiveness of Atlanta, you know, you can sell that pretty effectively. I, I think that matters, and I think the city government here is trying to do that. The, the thing I would say is um, states and cities do have an advantage. And I say it that way, it sounds a little funny, and I'm sure it doesn't feel like that when they're dealing with it in the budget process, but they have to balance their budgets. So they can't put a plan out that says we're going to borrow 40 cents on the dollar and do it in indefinitely and hope that it gets better. And, and I'm not suggesting that's exactly what somebody's done, but they don't have the option to, to even try it. 
And so they have to deal with it. And so when you've got folks that, that are in that situation with that backstop, the political will is easier to gather. And then the, uh, but the work has to be done. And, and I think um, what you see happening in Atlanta in particular, I think is, is positive in that direction. And I, I would tell you, if you watch some of the changes that have occurred here and see that there's a bit of a national spotlight on some of it from other cities, that should give some confidence that, that that's accurate. I mean, that's my, that's my best view on that. Jim. I was uh, handed a book by a member of your management team here in Atlanta about some of these principles. But maybe what I'm curious about is coming at this a little different way. You know, I've heard the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has gotten vocal. I've heard commentary by uh, the, the chairman of Verizon. What other companies have joined this, this fight, uh, and, and what are they doing? Well, you know, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can be exhaustive in that list. Um, but, but I can tell you that, um, and by the way, they might not want me to put them in the, in the, in the same place, but um, certainly the chamber has been vocal. Certainly a lot of the members of the chamber have become more vocal. You know, I would tell you there are companies in, in Atlanta and Georgia that, that we find ourselves in a similar position with on a lot of these kinds of issues. Southern is one of those over time. Um, you know, without maybe, there's lots of small companies, lots of companies we do business with, as an example that I know, I hear from all the time. We, we completely are in agreement with what you guys are doing. We'd like to get more involved. Um, but, you know, Menards, I mean, is another example. I, I just would tell you that um, I'm probably not the best person to give you a list of those companies, but... They, they might not ought to do that themselves. Other? Thanks for your presentation, Jim. Um, <clears throat> this might be, we might need to get you back for this one, but I would love to hear a little bit about how Georgia Pacific, under private ownership versus you know, public ownership before, has, has changed or is different. Well, I, you know, without, without, knowing specifically how it was in the past because I wasn't there, uh, what I would say is what, what I describe with market-based management and that set of guiding principles we use, that is, that is how we approach our business every day. And so we think about what makes the free market society work, and then we try to apply those same principles inside the firm. And I would use examples like uh, that set of 10 guiding principles. We put that in a, in a bucket of our philosophy that we call virtue and talents. And we think about cultivating a culture based on those 10 principles. And we talk about it all the time. And when I say we talk about it, I don't mean it's on the wall and we refer to it. I mean, when we do interviews, we think about how do people fit this culture. When we do personal 360 evaluations, we ask for feedback from people based on those principles. How are they doing at modeling these principles? All the Georgia Pacific folks are shaking their heads, I can see in the room. and, and so. We try to drive a culture in the organization that's going to create this environment, and we try to do it in a way that creates that. You heard me talk about the principal entrepreneur. Sometimes we'll talk about a spontaneous order of entrepreneurs so that knowledge and decisions are kind of tied together, right? People with the best knowledge are making the decisions that, that are going to create value over time in the organization. So what I often say to people is just because I'm the boss doesn't mean I'm right. And if you're not willing to tell me that, if you're not willing to challenge me because you know better or... I mean, a simple example is, let's say I'm talking about something, in, which might easily be the case, by the way, and everyone in the room thinks, I have no idea what I'm talking about, and there's 50 better ways to do it, but nobody's willing to say it. Gives us no chance, right? That seems a little different than it was in the past. I can't say that for sure, right? But, but those are the kinds of things that are different. And then, obviously, being private, I mean, people know a lot less about what we do specifically. We don't have to have a vision that Wall Street agrees with. We, we base our, our vision and we bound our opportunities based on the capabilities we think we have advantages at, not on the industries we're in. So while you heard things about forest products and building products and packaging, we look at those businesses and say, we have a certain set of capabilities that provide us a competitive advantage. And we want to use those, those capabilities to go out and find the best opportunities to create value, not necessarily only in those spaces we exist in today. And that, that's also a different um, approach, and it's very hard to explain to somebody who's, who's an analyst on Wall Street who has 15 minutes to hear from you, right? So we, we're fortunate not to have to do that. And uh, I think there's things we do or try or pursue or spend time on where if we were having to have that dialogue with, with um, Wall Street, we'd be getting lots of comments about they don't understand it, it doesn't make sense, they, we must be crazy. And sometimes we are, right? Because if we're not willing to experiment, then we're never going to discover whether those opportunities are going to work for us. 
which means we have to accept that some of them are going to fail. And so that's another thing that's difficult, I think, more difficult. I shouldn't say it's difficult, but for a public company. And so those are things that are different, maybe. And then we don't, obviously, we don't have the, the cost and burden of the public activity, right? I spend a lot less of my time doing things like this or things, things on, on Wall Street than maybe my peers do in some public companies. Those are some examples. Others? You mentioned the under 30 crowd being 50-50 on the socialism free market. What do you guys, or what do you propose, how do we get in their minds, or what might Georgia Pacific be doing to try to affect that? So um, obviously that's a, that's a structural issue that has to be addressed. And um, I, would, I would tell you that if we're, not, if we're not in places like Terry College, in places like Florida State and SMU and universities across this country, if we don't have a balance in, in the leadership and the culture and the organizations, the economics departments maybe in particular, in those environments of people who study and understand free markets and teach about free markets and, and make the connections that, that I made today for you, then I think you know, we're going to continue to see that happen. Because the reality is, somewhere along the way, government became about solving our problems. Right? The Constitution wasn't written for government to restrain the people. It was written for the people to restrain government. And somehow we've switched that. And the expectations are different as a result of that. And, and I think it's structural in the way we learn, right? I mean, it, it, we, we, we've done things to poll, for example, students. How many of you have heard this? How many of you have heard that? And to be honest, it's, it's surprising how few people have heard some of the connections that once you get into business, you see. And so I think we're going to have to make those structural changes so that the, there's balance in, in the process in education. And then we, we, people have to, again, the leadership, we have to commit to getting the right leaders, and we have to hold them accountable. So other questions? Um, when you talk about government regulation, it's a little bit of a slippery slope in that um, at some point we need some amount of government regulation Absolutely. for certain kinds of things. So is there a um, website or something that uh, provides a better idea of the kinds of bills or things before Congress or that government is considering to help us understand which items relative to government regulation you'd be in favor of and in which you are not? Because it, it's a very slippery slope here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of a, of a single source of that. And so I, I don't know that I have a specific answer for you. What, what I tell you that, that we, we try to do is think about um, the principles that, that I described and apply the regulation against those, right? So, so clearly, and I, I'm, I don't want you to think I don't believe this. I mean, re regulation has a place. Right? Government has a place, but it's in creating and supporting those productive policies that, that allow the marketplace to do its thing too, right? And, and so if you, if you think about um, those principles and apply those to, to regulation, and every, every one is different, so it's, it's not, there's not a simple answer to it, but we, we try to apply those principles to regulation and say, is this productive or is it not? And, and sometimes the question is, is it productive or redistributive? Sometimes is it productive or destructive? It depends on what type of regulation we're talking about. So, because I heard you mention subsidy, and and I thought that maybe you were more, well, you had more issues with subsidies and and keeping companies alive, aka General Motors and things like that. So. Well, I mean, generally speaking, what I would tell you is, if if uh, this is the way I would think about that, and, and each individual instance would be different, but if if the market Right, valued something highly enough, the resources would flow to it. Except for those things that government has to do, like I said, roads, ports, dams, I mean, national defense. That would suffer what we think about as the tragedy of the commons, right? Because it's, it's for everyone, but it's no one's, right? But, but some of those things, right, if it was of value and they were doing what we talked about, the jobs were creating real value, right? People valued those high, more highly than their alternatives. Capital, resources, human capital, all of those would flow to that opportunity to generate a return. 
Now, that doesn't mean there's never a single situation. But in general, that is the way I would think about that. And so the subsidy question, a lot of times that, that question comes up in the name of um, some sort of progress somebody wants to see. But you, you can look behind those things in almost every case and find a sponsor who has a benefit as a result of that. And I would tell you that's that cronyism I was talking about, right? And that's just the reality of it, right? And, and it always sounds really good, right? A clean energy this or clean energy that. And th that may be, there may be a goal that says we want to be energy independent, but at what cost, right? What, what, at what level of cost to society would you agree to that? That discussion doesn't happen often, right? And that's what we have to force to happen is let's have that dialogue. Because we could do it, but you probably wouldn't like your, your power bills. I'm trying to not pick on Southern Company, but you, you wouldn't like your gas bills. You wouldn't like a lot of other bills, right? And, and by the way, you don't have to because there is free trade and the market works. And so if, if the price of oil were to triple, as an example, I am very confident we would find alternatives to do things because it would be profitable to do that. So, you know, I mean, there's a balance in all of this, and there does have to be regulation, and government has a role, and I'm not saying anything different than that. But if I measure it against the principles that I just described, then, you know, more or less I can usually come to a conclusion about what side of it I believe, right? But sometimes you do have to look under, underneath and see who's... Who's driving? Okay. Please uh, join me in thanking Jim uh, for being here today and his thoughtful remarks. Jim. Thank you. It's, it's our tradition to present a keepsake uh, to all of our Terry Third Thursday speakers. Uh, so, Jim, let me present you with this uh, glass sculpture uh, that was made by uh, Loretta Eby uh, as a token of our appreciation for you coming today. One for one. I haven't dropped it yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.